When news was brought to us in the gun room that the danger was past, oh how our hearts did then relent and melt within us, wrote Reverend Richard Mather in his diary. The ship he had been on, the James, was part of the great migration of Puritans from Britain to the New World. His ship had the misfortune of being one of those at sea when what is still believed to have been the strongest hurricane to ever hit New England struck. They had no warning of what was to come, and the storm tossed the James, which had broken away from her anchors, towards the rocks until, to the relief of all on board, the storm moved on, and they could limp into Boston Harbor, thankful to be alive. Another reverend, who happened to be at sea at the time, was not so lucky. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, Watch and Wait on Thatcher Island? Here we are. Enjoy! Anthony Thatcher and his cousin, Reverend John Avery, had decided when they had come to New England that they would stick together and that they would always live in the same place. Therefore, when Reverend Avery and Anthony Thatcher both arrived in New England in 1634, where they would live was something of mutual interest. It seems to have been primarily determined by where Avery could find work, though, and the first offer came to found a church in Marblehead, Massachusetts, where there was a fishing community beginning to grow, but there was no church yet. Initially, Reverend Avery refused. He thought that the behavior of the people in Marblehead was too loose due to them being fishermen. The two cousins, therefore, initially settled in Newbury. The people of Marblehead had not given up the idea of having a church, though, and they continued to request that Reverend Avery come help them found a church. Avery also had other connections with the religious leaders of New England, since he had been a preacher in Wiltshire, England, before coming to Newbury, and these connections also began to add their voices to encourage him to go to Marblehead. Even the well-known Reverend John Cotton added his voice to tell Reverend Avery about all the good he would not only do for the community of Marblehead, but also for the moral fabric of the colonies as a whole, if he would go. Eventually, Avery agreed to go, and as he was going, Anthony Thatcher also prepared his family for the move. Anthony Thatcher's household comprised seven people, including four children from a previous marriage and his wife. Reverend Avery was traveling with his wife and children. His household included a total of 11 people, including a maid. In addition, they were traveling with a family friend named William Elliot. On the 11th of August, 1635, the group boarded the Pinnace Watch and Wait in Ipswich. The ship was owned by Isaac Allerton and was used for trade and passengers between Piscataqua and Boston. It was a familiar sight up and down the coast. Such a small ship did not require a large crew, and on this occasion, only four people formed the entire crew of the ship. Though the Thatcher and Avery families had embarked on the 11th, the ship did not depart Ipswich until the 12th, and Anthony Thatcher would write to his brother Peter that their departure was a cheerful one. If they had no worries as they left Ipswich, a swift change in weather would quickly cause them concern. On the night of the 14th, around 10 at night, a gale began to blow which split the sails of the watch and wait, which were described as being old. The sailors were not willing to try to replace the sails in the darkness, so the watch and wait was anchored with the intention of fixing the sails in the morning. Before morning came, a much larger storm hit the small ship, those on board soon learned that the storm that had split the sails had only been a hint of what was to come. No one can be entirely certain how strong the 1635 hurricane was, 
but it has been modeled based on accounts of the damage that it did against modern hurricanes, and some conclusions have been drawn. In Jamestown, the storm was mentioned, but it stayed offshore, and therefore was not a major event. At its peak, it was most likely a Category 4. As it hit the southern coast of Rhode Island and southern Massachusetts, it was still a Category 3, and it brought with it devastation with storm surges of 14 to 20 feet. No one can be certain how many were lost, especially since the records that remain were written by colonial governors and diarists who did not make note of Native American lives that were undoubtedly lost, in addition to the people lost in Boston and Plymouth. All around, the region ships were smashed into pieces, houses were damaged and destroyed, and trees were felled by the force of the storm. In modeling, the storm was primarily compared to storms in 1944 and 1954. But for a storm of that magnitude to hit north of North Carolina is extremely rare. And for those on the sea at the time, they could have never imagined the fury that was about to descend on them. On the watch and wait, their anchors were soon dragging, and though the sailors quickly let out more cable, that was also soon all run out and there was still no purchase for their anchor that would stop the ship from driving before the wind and waves. Soon, the boat was lifted up entirely and thrown onto the rocks known as Crackwood's Ledge off of Rockport. Every moment of this had been terrifying for everyone on board, from the passengers who clung to one another and did their best effort to offer one another reassurance to the crew who could do very little to stop the disaster that they could see coming. There was greater terror yet to come, though. Once the watch and wait was on the rock, they were high enough that the seas could no longer toss them around. But instead, the waves began to pound the ship to pieces. The people who were on the ship huddled in the cabin as first the foremast went, and then the mainmast was broken into pieces. The captain of the watch and wait offered no reassurance. He sat in the cabin with the passengers, clearly unsure of any action that could be taken. All of the passengers and crew were certain that any moment would bring their end. The only thing that roused them into action was when one of the sailors, who had already been washed overboard, was thrown back onto the ship and into the cabin by one of the huge waves that was battering them. This caused Anthony Thatcher to look out the door for the first time to properly assess where they were. He realized that they were stuck in between two rocks, and that the shore was close since he could see trees when he looked out. When Thatcher announced this to the cabin, the captain went out of the scuttle hole, presumably to take a look, but they never saw him again, and presumed that he had been washed overboard. The sailor, meanwhile, who had been washed overboard and then brought back by the sea, decided to leap overboard and try to reach the shore. But he too was never seen again. At this point, the only people on board still that Thatcher could see were his own family and his cousin's household. It seemed that everyone else had left the ship either willingly or because they had been washed away. Avery also seems to have noticed this because he turned to Thatcher and begged him not to leave him, feeling that it would be better to meet the end together since they had always stuck together in the past. Avery did not expect that there was any way to reach the shore safely since the sea was so angry, and to try it was fruitless. Thatcher agreed. Almost as soon as they had agreed not to leave the watch and wait, though, a wave broke off a piece of the ship and took Avery, Thatcher, one of Thatcher's daughters, and Avery's eldest son with it. All four of them found themselves on one of the rocks that held the ship. Finding a hole at the top of the rock, the four people who were on the rock called to the people on the ship to join them in this shelter, since they supposed it would be safer than staying on the ship as it broke apart. 
Thatcher's wife, Elizabeth, was in the middle of climbing through the scuttle hole to make her way to join them when a large wave struck the watch and wait, this time smashing the ship entirely to pieces. The same wave that smashed the ship also struck the people who had been standing on the rock and carried them away as well. Thatcher alone managed to find a purchase on the side of the rock as the water swept him away from where he was standing, and he ended up clinging to the side of the rock with his right hand with only his head above water. When aboard of the now-destroyed pinnace floated by, he was able to grab it with his left hand, and this became his flotation device. For some time, Thatcher was flung around by the sea, and several times almost gave up before resurfacing and catching his breath again. After an amount of time that he was not able to guess, he was flung to the beach of the nearby land, battered and bruised by the rocks and water, but alive. Almost as soon as he had crawled up from the water's edge, he began to look around to see if he could see anyone else, or the ship, but there was no longer anything but bits of wood from the watch and wait, and he could see no one in the water. On the beach near him, though, tangled in some of the wood from the wreck, was his wife. When the ship had been smashed to pieces by the wave, his wife had been in the scuttle, climbing through the scuttle hole, and she had been somewhat protected by it, as well as kept afloat in it, until she was deposited on the shore, buried under some other timber that was also washed onto the beach. Elizabeth was also very well bruised, but though Thatcher crawled to his wife's aid, by the time he reached her, she was already out of the wreckage, and the two were able to take stock. Though the couple looked around the shore, there was no sign of any other people who had been on the ship with them, and they did not hold out hope for long. Thatcher's children had all been young, far too young to manage the fight against the waves that had also claimed the sailors of the ship and the entire Avery family. Anthony Thatcher spent some time on that beach reproaching himself for having made the voyage with his children and lamenting that he had even brought them from England in the first place when he could have left them with his family in England or sent them back to England rather than had them join him in the move to Marblehead. Anthony Thatcher and Elizabeth were not able to mourn their loss for long, though. They were both wet and underdressed, and so they were soon forced to take action to preserve themselves. The couple began a search to see what they could find washed onto the beach. The first lucky find was made by Thatcher. He came across a knapsack that had a flint, steel, and powder horn, as well as the body of a goat that had also been a victim of the sea. Further on, he found one of his son's coats and his hat, which he was able to put on to keep warm. Thatcher's wife, meanwhile, found one of her petticoats, two cheeses, and some butter that had also washed up from the wreck. To the amazement of Thatcher, the powder horn was very good and had managed to keep the powder dry. So they were able to start a fire, cook some of the goat in a small brass pot that had also washed ashore, and drink a little water. The Thatcher couple spent four days on the island, which Anthony Thatcher had named Thatcher's Woe. At the time, the island was remote, and people did not often get too close to the island, which was known as a navigational hazard. The couple was therefore lucky when, on the Monday after the shipwreck, a boat came close enough to the island for them to signal her and be taken off. Out of the 23 people who had originally been on the watch and wait, only Thatcher and his wife reached Marblehead the day after they were taken off the island. The only body to wash ashore was that of Avery's eldest daughter, who Thatcher buried on the island. There was never a sign of anyone else. Anthony and Elizabeth Thatcher had no reason to remain in Marblehead, however. The entire reason why they had been making the voyage was for Avery to found a church, and Avery was now gone. The Thatcher couple instead moved to Yarmouth on Cape Cod, where they had three children. 
The couple had lost everything in the wreck, though. Their family, all of their goods, and the money they had been bringing with them to get a start in Marblehead. As a means of recompensing Thatcher for his losses, the general court gave Anthony Thatcher possession of the island on which he had lost everything. The 50-acre island, renamed from Thatcher's Woe to simply Thatcher Island, stayed in the family until it was bought back by the colonial government of Massachusetts for 500 pounds 80 years later. John Hancock, who owned ships on Cape Ann, had petitioned the government to erect lighthouses on the island, which had proven dangerous not only to the watch and wait. In 1771, two lighthouses were built on the island, but on a north-south axis to help sailors determine true north, and the first lighthouses to have ever been built in colonial America to designate a navigational hazard rather than the entrance to a harbor. The lighthouses would have done little to help the watch and wait caught in the terrible 1635 storm, even if they had been standing at the time. The people on board the ship were well aware of the danger they were in. They were simply no match against the force of the weather. William Bradford in Plymouth Plantation wrote that, being like those hurricanes and typhoons that writers make mention in the Indies, it began in the morning, a little before day, and grew not by degrees, but came with a violence in the beginning to the great amazement of many. It continued not in the extremities above five or six hours, but the violence began to abate. The signs and marks of it will remain this hundred years in these parts where it was the sorest. Perhaps the signs did not last a hundred years, but writers as late as 1685 noted marks from the storm still, speaking of its terrible force and devastation. To read Anthony Thatcher's letter to his brother Peter about the wreck of the Watch and Wait, please see A Book of New England Legends and Folklore and Prose and Poetry by Samuel Adams Drake, published in 1901, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.